people will be here to bathe at the confluence of the sacred rivers Jumna and Ganges. Here in this greatest of all pilgrimage places, the ashes of Gandhi and Nehru, the architects of modern India, were strewn on the waters. And so too Nehru's murdered successors, his daughter Indira, and in 1991 his grandson Rajiv. In India, the currents of sacredness run deep indeed. Among the millions of ordinary Indians from all castes and walks of life are holy men and women who've renounced the material world for a life of austerity and meditation, one of India's oldest callings. Here too are followers of the world's oldest living god, the creator and destroyer, the man-woman, the great yogi, Shiva himself. India was one of the earliest of the great civilizations, and it defined the goals of civilized life very differently from the West. The West raised individualism, materialism, rationality, masculinity as its ideals. India's great tradition insisted on non-violence, renunciation, the inner life, the female as pillars of civilization. And through all the triumphs and disasters of her history, she hung on to that ideal, an eternal quest to identify humanity with the whole of creation a unity in diversity. As our troubled century draws to its close, a deeper understanding of the achievements of other civilizations has become a necessity. As Mark Twain said here a century ago, the Indians may seem poor to we rich Westerners, but in matters of the spirit, it's we who are the paupers and they who are the millionaires. History is full of empires of the sword, but India alone created an empire of the spirit. Our search for India's past begins in an old British library in the heart of Calcutta, once capital of the British Indian Empire. The British colonized India for 200 years, but already that time is beginning to feel like a temporary interruption in the amazing continuities of Indian history. The memorials of that era are fading now with every monsoon rain, and a deeper past is reasserting itself the India before the Europeans. India's history was almost unknown to the outside world till the 18th century. And then here in the Asiatic Society in Calcutta, the Europeans first discovered that India's sacred language, Sanskrit, the root of all the North Indian dialects, was akin to Greek and Latin. The oldest living language, it had entered India in the second millennium BC with Aryan invaders and the earliest and most revered Sanskrit literature comes from that time. Of all the great collection of Sanskrit sacred texts known collectively as the Vedas, the oldest is the Rig Veda. It comprises about a thousand archaic chants and hymns, older even than Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, preserved over an immense period of time by oral transmission. This is the oldest surviving written text of the Rig Veda, and it dates only from the 14th century AD. But the first hymns in this collection could have been composed as early as 2000 BC. The tale they tell seems to be one of the migration of groups of Sanskrit-speaking peoples who called themselves Aryans, literally the noble ones, a migration into northern India. 
It suggests that they found there, when they arrived, a civilization which was already thriving, with cities and towns and forts, rich in cattle and treasure, with a dark-skinned population who contrasted with the light-complexioned northerners, the Aryans. The Rig Veda implies a long period of interaction between the two cultures, but it also certainly suggests that in places the Aryans destroyed the towns and cities of the native population, subdued them and carved up their land for settlement. The location of these contacts and battles is made quite clear in the poems. It's that historical battleground extending from the Kabul River in Afghanistan through the Khyber Pass down into what is now Pakistan and into the Punjab. The area called by the Aryans Sapta Sindhava, the seven rivers, the greatest of which was the Indus. From the very beginning, rivers were sacred to Indian culture literally the source of life. And the first Indian cities grew up on the rich alluvial soil left by the annual flooding of the Indus. In the 1920s, the clues in the Rig Veda led archaeologists here to the burning plain of Sindh in what is now Pakistan to find a hitherto unknown and unsuspected civilization. A forgotten empire which had traded with Babylon and Ur of the Chaldees. During Egypt's Pyramid Age, Mohenjo-Daro had been the biggest city on earth and center of the most widespread civilization. But the language spoken here is still undeciphered. It's the greatest mystery in archaeology, and why the city died is still not known. Yet all over Mohenjo-Daro are clues which point to direct connections between this past and the present day. In the middle of town was a great brick-lined bath, recalling the central importance of ritual bathing in today's India. Here, perhaps, was a priest or guru, eyes narrowed in meditation. On merchant seals were sacred trees and animals, still characteristic of India today. And here, surrounded by wild beasts sitting lotus fashion, the ancestor of the great yogi Shiva himself, the oldest god in the world. Those living links with the deep past point our search for India's roots to the village. This is Kasambi on the Jamna River south of Delhi. The village has been the basis of Indian life for thousands of years. Two-thirds of her population of 850 million still live in places like this. And absorbing the invasions of Aryans, Muslims and British, it was the village which preserved the essential values of Indian culture. <laughs> The key to those values is the deep-rooted belief that all life is sacred. In the overfed and secular West, the idea of the sacred cow may be meaningless. But here, for poor people, it pulls loads, gives milk, butter, fuel, manure. And to kill it is literally sacrilege. 
The basic beliefs of Hinduism reinforced this idea of the connectedness of life. At a village shrine, one of the highest priestly caste offers a libation and a Sanskrit prayer. This black stone icon, descended from the phallic stones of Mahenjo-daro, is the mark of the god Shiva, a symbol of the life force. This well is used by the lowest caste, the untouchables, who do the dirtiest jobs. The caste system is an elaborate, graded form of social segregation based on what job you do. But it may have begun with colour, a kind of apartheid, keeping the light-skinned Aryan invaders separate from the conquered, darker-skinned native peoples. In the first millennium BC, the fusion of the Aryan newcomers and the older culture bore fruit in some of the greatest spiritual works of humanity. And amazingly, these ancient poems are still the most popular diet for mass audiences in India today. Especially the Mahabharata. Today's episode is virtually the Indian gospel, the Gita. It is obsession with the senses and the material life, says the divine Krishna, which is the ruin of reason and will destroy humanity itself. India's conscience is perhaps her greatest gift to the world. Around 500 BC, city life revived in the Ganges Valley, and a renaissance took place as glorious as the age of Pericles in Greece. At its center was Benares. For the pilgrims bathing here on the morning of Shiva's festival day, Shivaratri, the city of Shiva is beyond time and history, a place of redemption. Hindu hopes to come here once in a lifetime to bathe in Mother Ganges.